Hello, my name is Armin Jerome. I'm a Red River Metis from Manitoba, and uh, I build Red River carts with my wife, Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly Jerome. Uh, I've been helping my husband build Red River carts now for, I guess, going on 15 years. Um, it's taken us a lot of places around the world, uh, and we'd like to welcome you to our home and our shop and uh, let us guide you through what we do. Um, when we're talking about Red River carts, we're talking about the carts that were made in Red River in this area. Now, uh, carts were made, different kinds of carts were made all over the world. Different kinds in France and, and uh, England and even in Canada and Quebec. But uh, they've been making carts all over the world for thousands of years. But uh, the ones we make are indigenous to uh, Red River. Uh, the reason I call them Red River carts is because uh, at, at one time before the roads, first roads were came in here, we're in an area that was landlocked and it was a Red River colony. So uh, at one time when the fur traders were around, they, they basically were able to stick to the waterways and they uh, trapped for fur and, and traveled all the waterways by canoe. And then as time went on and then they progressed then they needed some sort of a vehicle that they could use to travel overland. So uh, without any roads to here to bring in wagons or any kind of a vehicle, they had to try to make their own. So uh, back in 1801, the very first Red River cart was created by the Metis, uh, Pemina area. And uh, that first cart, was just had uh, basically slabs cut off of logs and with a plain axle and they used that for a while. And this was recorded by uh, uh, Alexander Henry the Younger and he had a memoir and that's the only basic memoir that we have of the early Red River carts. So then he had written a year later in 1802 that now they had four spokes and they started to, to use fellows, wheel segments. And then after that, he had written another article that described the, the evolution of the Red River cart. Unfortunately, they basically, uh, a lot of the information had died with him. He had drowned a few years later. So uh, a lot of uh, the Red River cart knowledge and was lost over the years. And me and my wife have been trying to uh, figure it out through trial and error. So I started building Red River carts in uh, 2001, around 2000, 2001, and we didn't really know what we were doing because there were blueprints around, but uh, unfortunately the blueprints were, uh, it was created by people that didn't really know how the carts were made. So there was a lot of trial and error going into building these carts. And uh, why this was important to me was uh, because I didn't want to build just a cart and then say it was a Red River cart without it being historically correct. Otherwise, what was the purpose? Not only that, there were people building certain types of two-wheeled carts and claiming they were Red River carts without historical background. So uh, that was, to me, that was not the right way to do things. And not only that, a lot of these carts were not functional. So uh, we wanted to build Red River carts that were functional, had a historical background to them, meaning uh, through a lot of our research, through some of the pictures from the 1800s, you could still focus in a little bit on the poor quality of pictures, but we were able to determine uh, how many fellows, wheel segments were in the wheels, how many spokes were in the wheels, an approximate si uh, dish, because the wheels were dished. 
Uh, so is that going over terrain that the cart would be more stable? They wouldn't tip over? So uh, that's one of the functions of the Red River cart. Then after the Red River cart was uh, being more useful mid-1800s, they were able to travel and hunt buffaloes across the prairies. These carts were used right across through Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, into the states before the states was a country and they were in search of buffalo and that was another industry. So it added, be, be, uh, besides the fur trade, they were able to bring in buffalo hides, uh, pemmican that they made out of the buffalo meat. So that basically created a new nation of uh, the, in, the, the ch children of the Indian and the, and the French or Indian and Scottish and Irish and it was a, a group called the Métis and so these are my ancestors. I met Armand in 2008. Uh, very quickly afterwards, we realized we had an awful lot in common. I am not Métis, I am Ukrainian, um, but we're both woodworkers. Uh, we're both very much outdoorsmen. Um, I guess you have to say outdoor people. Now you can't say outdoorsmen. <laughs> um, we uh, love horses, we love trail riding. Um, it uh, just turned out that you know we both wanted to start building these carts or actually I wanted to start building them with them. Um, been doing it for 15 years now. The carts have taken us to France. Uh, there's a cart at the Juno Beach Museum honoring the Métis veterans. Uh, we took another cart to the uh, Victoria Museum in um, I think in Vancouver mm -hmm. uh, for the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, we've got uh, carts, oh there's a cart in Edinburgh in Scotland. Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, along a lot of trails, um, within schools. Uh, we do a lot of teaching, a lot of his historical teaching, Métis teaching. Uh, we've had classes come in and build carts. Um, we do a lot with them and they've taken us places that we would never have been able to go without the cart getting us into that situation. Uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work. It's very hard work. For us, it's a labor of love because we, we really don't make a, a lot of money, but you know, it's enough to, we're fine, we're fed, we're good. Um, but to promote the culture and to get people involved, um, it's been involved in reconciliation ceremonies um, just wonderful, wonderful ceremonies. And it now brings us to what we've labeled as the Red River Métis Ride of Hope. And it's, in, um, it's uh, to uh, help Ukrainian orphans and the communities that um, are trying to protect them and bring them home. And we're trying to raise funding now by having a trail ride that will take us from Haddishville, Manitoba, at a place called uh, Sophie's Restaurant. Um, and we will trail uh, over a couple of weeks until we land in Lorette, uh, where they'll be doing some more festivities. And that's on June 3rd, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we'll be in Richer for May 27th. Um, they've got festivities, uh, also the Dawson Trail that was the original trail that the Red River Carts would have traveled on 125 years ago. Over 150, yeah. Yeah, it's a long time ago. So it's a very significant trail that they're marking. 
um, it'll be an amazing uh, event that entire day. Um, Richer is um, very grassroots and they're, they're, they keep their heritages and, and it's almost the majority of the people there are Métis. Um, there are several ways to participate. Of course, you can come along, uh, you can ride. Uh, we have people with wagons. We'll have three Red River carts uh, going. Um, you can also um, participate by donating. Um, we have a GoFundMe page called the um, Red River Métis Ride of Hope, uh, and that's on GoFundMe. Um, the website is uh, the, the Métis Ride of Hope dot com. I hope I'm correct. Mm -hmm. The Métis Ride of Hope dot com. Um, there's fundraising meals at Sophie's uh, May Long Weekend. Uh, Darren Lavallee's band will be playing um, both the May Long Weekend and the weekend afterwards at Richer. Um, am I forgetting anything? Well, There's going to be silent auctions. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, Sophie's restaurant is doing twenty-five dollar gift card draws mm -hmm. uh, for every meal. Um, the carts, the wagons, the horses will be available for the public to view. Not at every trail site, but at the um, the three sites it's available at are Sophie's, uh, Richer Rodeo Grounds, and the town of Lorette. And we will culminate the ride on June 4th, Sunday, June 4th, at the Centre of Canada. I'm not completely sure how many of us will show up there, but the Red River Cults will be there for sure. Um, when we say that we do rides, basically we make Red River carts, but we also do heritage rides. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is because uh, in the, uh, uh, the Métis were forgotten people in Canada. And uh, so it's only in the last few decades that they're kind of making a comeback. And uh, I call it a resurgence. So it's a kind of a resurgence of a culture. So what's come back now, where uh, if you lived in the area, you'll see that there's now, the Miti uh, had, have their own kind of dance. It's like a, a hybrid type dance between First Nation type dance and also the clogging from uh, Scottish dancers. So they've uh, combined it to make jigging. So the Miti have a dance called the jig. So that's being revived now. You see a lot of dancers around practicing the, the jig. Fiddling. And also the music. They have a, a certain type of their own kind of fiddle music. Now it's a, it's um, kind of, I think it was based on Irish and Scottish type fiddle music, but they put their own thing into it because they were secluded in Red River. So now they had their own ideas and they made their own kind of music out of the fiddle. So it's a Métis fiddle music. And uh, also they did their, their own beating. They were called uh, flower, flower people, people. Uh, at one time. The Europeans called them that because they, they liked flowers. They liked bright colors. So they would bead their harnesses, their clothes, their buckskins would have all these. And one of the main flowers that you will ever see when, when you see the Métis in in groups would be prairie rose that's their favorite the prairie rose so there's there's that there's also a sash which uh, was adopted from the 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 fur trade the the french voyageurs so this sash is is a type of belt that they hand weave and they've actually made it very personal some families have their own ways to make it they have their own designs their own colors and actually it's similar, if you ever seen a Ukrainian sash, they're, they're very similar. There's some differences, but they're very similar yeah. to the Ukrainian sash. And Ukrainians do a tremendous amount of beating as well. Yeah, 
So that's why we have yeah. some common interests. <laughs> so, and then there's also the language. Now, the language of the Métis is called Machif. Now, that was more of a, 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 a when I tell you that there was the French uh, fur traders that came here, the voyageurs, and then the First Nations people, and then they created their own type language. And you know, when you're secluded in a, in a place, it happens all over the world. Now all of a sudden, a bit of both languages come into it. There's a little bit of English slang, maybe some Scottish there mixed in. So this language was also dying. And uh, thank God there was a few people that still carried it on through their grandparents. And now they're starting to teach it. And uh, they're putting uh, vowels and syllables into it because it was actually passed on from generation to generation by ear. It was not ever written down. So they're trying now to have a written version of it so that they could pass it on to future generations. So this part of the, of the culture is part of that resurgence. And the Red River Cart is a big part of it because that's what basically helped create the Métis Nation by creating industry. The buffalo hunts that they went on were a big part of uh, uh, government, uh, their own type government laws. Uh, they call it the laws of the hunt. And some of these laws of the hunt were created uh, in some of the government uh, plans when they created the laws. So uh, that was a very important thing. So anyways, when I say this resurgence, that was ha is happening now, why we're a part of it was because everybody has their own way to f on this resurgence and we have ours and our expertise is the Red River cart. So it was important for us to build a cart that works, that we could hook up to an animal. Some people call it an ox cart, but they didn't always just use oxes on it. They used horses and they used uh, mules, whatever livestock that they needed but uh, you'll see a lot of pictures with horses, and that's what we use. We have used the odd ox. Now, um, Too slow. yeah, they do walk slow, and that sometimes doesn't always fit into our plans of mm -hmm. traveling on these trail rides because when we plan these trail rides out, what we want to do is showcase the culture, showing the people how the carts worked, uh, show them in action. It's like taking a museum piece out of the museum and putting it in an actual, on your, your streets and on in the fields. So you're bringing back a part of history. And we noticed that that was very important to a lot of the people. I've been, I've been doing this for over 20 years, doing these heritage rides. And the reason why it became so important is because uh, people talked about the carts for many, many years, uh, even after they became extinct. They became extinct around the later 1800s when the railroad came in, then basically they were able to bring in heavy metals, machinery, um, and they were able to bring covered wagons in. So the Red River Cart, which uh, one of the things about the Red River Cart is there's no nails and there's no metal pieces in it. You have to remember you're back to a time when you couldn't get heavy metals here. They brought everything portaged with canoes and it was mainly food, flour, supplies, and the, the main metal would be guns, maybe ammunition, and axes, knives. That was the most important things. To bring heavy wagon wheels uh, by boat was just not, it just wouldn't work. So these carts were made without any metal pieces, no metal bands around the, the hubs, no metal bands around the wheels. So they were able, actually, these carts, because there was no gravel and no pavement, you could actually use the hardwoods that they used here and just used these uh, Red River carts without all these other specialized metal parts, they would go along the prairie, along dirt and grass, and it wouldn't harm them that much. They did have a low lifespan as far as the wheels went in the cart and they just kept building them. So that was the one thing. So as I was saying, we like to use these carts to express our uh, part of our this Métis resurgence. And when I say that uh, people talked about them for years, uh, people, older people that I knew when I was just a young person, they talked about the Red River Cart, but no one actually seen one. Um, so 
I have this saying where, you know, you could um, tell somebody something and they will uh, soon forget about it, but you'll never, they'll never forget how you make them feel. And that's how we made people feel when we went through towns and they saw us going. So these Métis journeys were an important part of our culture and an important part of, of this resurgence. And every time we do a Red River cart journey, which we've done numerous times over the last 20 some years for over thousands of miles. And so this latest one is just another one that's expressing our, uh, our uh, heritage and our part of this, uh, of this culture expression. I hope you'll join us somewhere along the trail um, this may be our last one. We've all gotten a bit too old and mm -hmm. a bit broken and um, it's getting harder and harder every year. Um, it would be wonderful to see anybody come out and, and just enjoy themselves and take part in the fiddling and the jigging and the dancing and the food. There are tremendous amounts of food. Um, Sophie's restaurant in Hattersville is a Ukrainian restaurant. Um, they're going to put a Métis twist on it though, so that should be really interesting. Um, and just the people, the culture is phenomenal. Um, I, I've always been welcomed in. I've, you know, and I, and even in our own home, we have that policy. Everybody's welcome, and everybody gets fed, and um, everybody has a good time. And there's always somebody singing or somebody dancing, or it's mm -hmm. always a lot of fun. So we're hoping that uh, we project that in the in the trail ride as well. We're hoping that we have a nice May long weekend because anybody that was born in Manitoba knows. In May, for May long weekend, we could have two feet of snow or we could have a ton of bugs. So we're, we're hoping for good weather because it's so beautiful now. So hopefully, um, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to listen to us today. And we hope we've... I'd like, I'd like to say one a little bit more because of me being Métis and my wife being Ukrainian heritage is what also brought this on was uh, this wouldn't have happened, this journey, probably if it wasn't for our, our feelings towards the, the, the people of Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, especially the youth, they don't know what's going on. Yeah. We just hear stories, we watch the news, and uh, we understand about uh, the plight of the people. You would think in, in this day and age that there wouldn't be this sort of a thing happening and it's still happening in certain places of the world. And uh, when we see these certain films or pictures of these children with their, without parents and, and including the ones that have been deported, and I, I'll say kidnapped, yeah. and uh, we're hoping that somehow uh, by doing this and doing this fundraiser, we're, we're not rich people. We're, we're hoping that we can raise something, you know, some sort of money that we can help them out somehow. If we help so much as one child out, yeah. then that's important. That's important to us. Yeah. And uh, we just, uh, what really inspired us is we just do not understand the lack of empathy on the Russian side that they can see what they're doing to the, to, to the people, to these children. And we worry about other things. It's not just also what's happening right now. What about the, the children that are just born, the, the really young ones? What about the trauma? How are they gonna grow up? These kids, somebody's gotta look after them and help them. Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's hard on us. It's it hard is. to we we know we know a lovely Ukrainian people, and it kind of got us started on all that, didn't it? Just mm -hmm. hearing what's really going on back there and how hard it is for everybody, and it's very hard to sit in such a wonderful place like Canada. And, yes, and not not know your children are safe or that. It's very hard to comprehend. Um, we, uh, 
We pray for everybody in the Ukraine. We hope this war ends very soon and that you get your children back home um, and that, uh, that this never happens again. But I, I'm, we'll just do our small part and that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should say that uh, something like this, um, I have to say, because I'm Aboriginal, the same, a, a similar thing happened to the Aboriginal children being taken away from their families here in Canada even, uh, and uh, being sent to schools and a lot of times uh, there was, uh, they had disappeared, they had died, there was problems, but the one thing that, that uh, we're sad about that, but at least there's some sort of a thing that the Canadian government, there's a reconciliation. A few times we've been participating in this reconciliation and it starts with governments telling the people, admitting that they were wrong and saying, I'm sorry. Now, can you imagine if at one point Putin or whoever it is replacing him in Russia goes up to Zelensky or the next leader and, and to the people of Ukraine and say, we're sorry. That would go a long way. Can you imagine? And only when governments do that is there going to be peace in this world. If you want to shake hands, you, you can't shake hands with a fist. Right, hon? Right. Right. <laughs> Should we thank the nice people? Sure. <laughs> thank you for watching this. Uh, we hope that we could make a difference. We're, we're doing our best. It's very difficult uh, planning this and putting this together. It was a short period of time. and We have six days. Six days left and we're not quite ready yet. So we're still going to have to buck up and, and do this <laughs> ride. We'll get her done. Yeah, get her done. Get her done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.